I'm Mark Unger, producer of Roundtable. Because we find this presentation so special, we really would like for you to see this. Please watch. Good evening. Welcome to Single Shot Show at Manhattan Neighborhood Network's Roundtable. The theme of the day will be a decisive moment. We all know this uh, concept and we implement it when we're trying to make a photo to be interesting and uh, to reach the perfection. But if we would look at the concept in a bro uh, broader scope, we will realize that this concept works for civilizations. It works for the general uh, history of photography. And in order to discuss it, we uh, invited uh, uh, a brilliant photographer, a traveler, a National Geographic journalist, and a specialist in decisive moment, Ira Block. Hello, Ira. Thank you for joining us tonight. Alex, and, uh, it's great to be here. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, decisive moment. Basically, uh, our civilization for the past hundred years reaching decisive moments in many areas every day and uh, I know that one of the biggest interests you have uh, in your photography is actually capturing decisive moments of civilization so why wouldn't we start there yes uh, I like to photograph different cultures and especially how emerging cultures are changing and I'm always looking for a moment that helps tell a story so uh, do you have any general premise of the story or it's every time it's something different? Every time I go somewhere I do some research and I try to get an idea of how a place is changing, how people are changing. And with that information I look for photos that illustrate those changes. Mm -hmm. I, I tell stories with my photos. That's the most important thing. My photos have to tell a story. Well, I know that one of those stories is actually the book you recently published about Cuban baseball. I'm pretty sure not a lot of Americans even realize that Cuba is a big hub for baseball games. And uh, as I understand, you found something very special uh, related to American history in the way this uh, scenery looks in Cuba right now. Would you like to tell me a little bit about it? Most people don't realize that they've been playing baseball in Cuba almost as long as we have here in the U.S. The oldest professional stadium in the world in existence is in Matanzas, Cuba, and the first pro game was played there in 1874. 1874. Long time ago. A while. My idea for this book was I wanted to tell the story of baseball in Cuba, not so much the action of the sport, mm -hmm. but how important the sport was to the culture of the country. And I wanted to document this before it changed, before baseball became a big business like it is in the United States and in Japan, mm -hmm. and even in the Dominican Republic. Absolutely. And for me, documenting this and recording people that were playing baseball, involved in baseball for the love of it, and how the culture of the country was so enveloped by baseball. That was the theme I wanted to get in this book. And as I understand, uh, the American uh, feedback on it, especially from generation who remember different baseball in America was, it's like looking in my childhood, remembering uh, how it was back then, right? Absolutely. When I show this book to people in their 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, they look at the pictures and it brings back those memories of growing up as a kid either in a rural environment or, mm -hmm. in, or in an urban environment and playing baseball and just going out in the afternoon after school, finding some friends and playing ball. Now, 
kids are at home, they're on the computer, they're doing homework, they're on their phones, but back then, kids would go out and just have a great time finding some way of playing baseball. Well, in general, Cuba is the example of this decisive moment in history of na nation. The country right now definitely is going through a very big change in terms of it being open to the world and uh, being integrated into the world society. Even though it wasn't in Amazon jungle, it was definitely secluded. And now a lot of things that we can observe at this particular moment probably will be gone. So it is indeed one of the most important things to record it now. But uh, besides uh, Cuba, can you give me a couple of other examples of these decisive moments being captured? Maybe something more exotic, after all, it is a relatively close example to us. Well, in, I've been to Mongolia. Mongolia. Six, seven times. I just came back about three weeks ago. Mm -hmm. And Mongolia is another place that's going through a change. The people of Mongolia, I would say, at this time, 30 to 35 percent of the Mongolian people are still nomadic herders. Indeed, yeah. And that is something that's not common. It's a very authentic country, mm -hmm. and the people there live an authentic lifestyle, but it's going to go through a change. So uh, you actually had the chance to observe the progression. You actually can uh, see the difference between your first visits and what is happening there now, right? Yeah, my first visit there was probably in early 2000, and my last visit was three weeks ago. Mm -hmm. And there's changes. There, There's mining going on. There's coal. There's development. They're building a middle class. Mm -hmm. And like every other place, even in America, young kids that, say, used to live on a farm, mm -hmm. They go to school, they come to the city, they don't want to go back to the farm, they want to do something else. Oh, naturally, yeah. In Mongolia, these nomadic families are following their herds around. In the winters, it's negative 40 degrees, and it's very isolated. So the young kids, if they could come into the city, work construction or work you know, on an oil rig or a coal mining operation, that's what they want to do. So there's a change going on. And the important thing is the balance of your old culture with the modern culture. How are you going to keep traditions from the old and live in the new world? Hmm. Well, that's definitely something there is not an easy question to resolve, but uh, let me ask you this. Uh, a while ago, we was uh, talking to a photographer who had experience of photographing uh, native population in India. And uh, he was doing it for a prolonged time, and he observed something very interesting, that uh, before uh, his uh, efforts to photograph somebody was welcomed, because there was no cameras, and people was happy to be even uh, just captured on film and uh, preserved for eternity, even if they wouldn't get a copy of the picture, it was still something they would want to do. Now uh, it's often frowned upon, and people actually want to photograph him as a visitor and some, somebody exotic. Did you observe something similar in uh, this uh, direction in Mongolia? I think people in these places now are used to tourists coming. Mm -hmm. It's so easy to travel now, and it's gotten less expensive. Everyone's got cameras, sophisticated cameras, or if mm -hmm. they don't have a sophisticated camera, at least they have their phone camera. And I think local people are getting tired of being photographed. I can't imagine. Did it uh, impact on uh, efforts to actually making it look inauthentic? Did it affect uh, the final results for I mean, uh, you work in National Geographic and they have utmost standards, uh, including standards for uh, image look authentic and look natural. I can imagine that if people are so used to posing for photos, they probably don't look as authentic as they used to before. Well, part of what I do, part of being a professional and what I do is I know how to deal with people. Naturally, yes. I know how to interact with people. 
and I know how to make people feel comfortable. Mm -hmm. So if I'm in a situation with people that at first may not be interacting the right way and not look natural, mm -hmm. I, know how to, I know how to make it happen. It's part of my tools. I know how to work the camera. I know how to make nice pictures, but you, to get everything to work, you have to know how to approach people, deal with people, and interact with people. Well, it's definitely a skill that is not so easy to master, especially if you have to do it in a language that you don't know. And I presume you didn't know every language in every area you visited. I wish I did. I'd love to be able to it's speak to easy. people and communicate directly, but no, I'm limited in my languages, and I'll have a translator. But there's also body language. Exactly. And I know how to look at people, how to move my body, watch how their body's reacting, and make just make the magic happen. Well, that's definitely something that's not so easy to achieve. And uh, judging by pictures, you mastered it pretty well. We'll uh, get back to this thought after the break. And I wanted to actually touch a little bit more on the subject of many people with cameras. Okay. Hello, this is Alex AG from uh, Single Shot with another single trick. Tonight I want to tell you a little bit about post-production. There is one feature in uh, Photoshop and many other photo editing programs that being used uh, scarcely. That's channels. And uh, there is only one reason why it is so. Nobody understands what it is for. Well, not nobody, but a lot of people don't. So when you see an image just like this, uh, you are getting in channel that. And that's very counterintuitive because you actually supposed to be seeing this. Three separate sets of color, not of grayscale. So if you would think of each channel as specific color, for example, of red being red instead of gray, blue being blue instead of uh, gray, and green likewise, you'll uh, find channels very useful for editing. people with serious cameras coming to all the exotic locations and even roaming the streets of New York for that matter. The uh, photography se uh, scene changed a lot recently and that's another decisive moment we actually live in through, the decisive moment for photography as a media. Uh, once photography switched from film to digital, it was a pretty big switch, but right now we have something even more interesting going on. Technology is not changing instrumentally, but it's improving, expanding, and getting more sophisticated in so many ways that uh, the whole perception of photography is changing. So how does it uh, affect you? I know that you started with uh, film photography, correct? Yeah, I started back in high school, film, darkroom in my basement developing film. Mm -hmm. It was magic, making a print and seeing it appear in the tray. Oh, I fell in love with photography. I shot film and I think shooting with film was incredible training for me to get the image right in the camera, to connect with my subjects. I think now digital is fantastic. I love it. It's changed a lot in my life. My workflow has changed. I could get pictures out to people easily. I know where everything is. I could call them up on my computer. Mm -hmm. And the dynamic range of the digital sensors, I could take pictures in very harsh light. Mm -hmm. And the high ISO, 
I'm shooting, I've shot some pictures at ISO 52000 with my Sony cameras. Can't imagine. And what it's done is it's opened up a world that I could not photograph before. Before mm -hmm. you get those ISOs up so high, there are things you could not photograph, or if you photograph them, you had to light you them. Better do them. And then lighting them changes a lot of the energy. So Absolutely, yes. So it's been great, but on the other hand, a lot of people think they could go out and buy an expensive digital camera, mm -hmm. and I've got the camera, I'm going on a trip, I'm a photographer. No. Well, one thing they d didn't come up with yet is the make it awesome button. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe one day, but uh, yes, indeed, uh, digital cameras did uh, introduce a lot of people to possibility to take a picture, but they didn't necessarily make them photographers. And how uh, even the best uh, masters of photography now feel, I wouldn't say threatened, but in a way uh, kind of pushed in a corner by the plethora of images. And they not necessarily even close in quality to what a master photographer can do, but uh, they acceptable and a lot of people who just look at images on uh, their social media accounts, they don't know any better. So the works of uh, serious photographers in a way getting lost in it. How did it affect uh, you? How did, uh, how do you, do you deal with this? Yeah, the world of photography has definitely changed and we're in a world not just in photography but of mm -hmm instantaneous gratification, mm -hmm. spontaneity, do it now, get it now, see it now, move on. That's Twitter, Instagram, the news, everything's changed. So in photography for me, I still look at people's pictures and I think, okay, they're taking, you know, it's good that people are taking pictures, they're aware of photography, it's been great for the mm -hmm. camera industry, the photographic community, the whole idea of communication. Mm -hmm. I use Instagram now. I love Instagram. Instagram is the new way I publish my photos. I have 335,000 followers, and they make comments, and I answer their comments. I like that interaction. But for the, I'm a professional. This is a way I work. Yes. I think the average person gets the camera and they paid a lot of money mm -hmm. and the camera gets the right exposure, gets the right focus, gets everything right, but the camera does not think for you. Indeed. And people are using these expensive cameras, but they're just pointing and shooting. They're not thinking and shooting. And I do a lot of workshops and I teach people I say, you, you know, you've got to think. What's, what are you looking at? What's in the corners of your viewfinder? A lot of people concentrate on the center mm -hmm. of the camera. Yes. And that's where there's a person there, that's where they're focusing on. They're forgetting there's more area. And I use, you know, I try to teach people, use composition to bring a dynamic look to what you're photographing. Well, most the, the first thing that uh, most of the people who are not formally trained in photography tend to do is to center the object, uh, objective of their photo. And uh, obviously, 90% of the time, it's not the best solution to No, but it's all. the easiest, and they show it to their friends, and the friends go, that's great. Yeah. Uh, when I do workshops, first thing I tell people is, when you come back from a trip, Mm -hmm. You show the picture to your friends, you show the pictures to your family. They're mm -hmm. going to tell you the pictures are great. Naturally. I'm not. I'm <laughs> going to tell you what's wrong with the pictures. I'm going to tell you what you need to do to make real photographs, well, that's, not snapshots. Well, that's the art of photography, what it's, what it's all about. Exactly. So uh, you mentioned that you are uh, teaching. Uh, what is uh, the age group you're normally working with? You're working with younger students, you're working with uh, people who actually seen the world with film photography and early digital photography, or just uh, 
the modern world where everything have a camera. I'm working with a mixture of people. I get some young. Uh, a lot of the people are older because they have the time to take off because my workshops are usually in exotic places. Mm -hmm. And they, these people usually have good equipment. But I also have some people that come along with just a camera phone. And camera phones can take good photos, but you as a photographer have to make it a good photo. The camera could, could you know, the phone could take a picture. You have to make it a picture. And it's harder with the phone because you're limited. You don't have the lens capabilities you do with other cameras. Exactly. Well, that's actually a very good exercise. I don't know if you're using it on your students, but you could give it a try, basically tell them, now put your cameras away and do the same thing with your phone. And sometimes, well, the same idea some, with my more advanced students, I'll say, take off the zoom lens and just work with a 35 millimeter or a 50 millimeter lens. Same concept with the phone. You've got a certain lens on there, a certain field you're looking at. Mm -hmm. You have to find photos that work in that field. Indeed. You're not going to take a picture of something 200 meters away and blow it up. You have to, that's just not a picture you could take. You have to find another type of picture that fits into the format. Well, that's how it works with prime lenses. With the phone, you can actually zoom in, but uh, it's not only about the focal distance of the lens in a phone. It's uh, about the way uh, those lenses actually interpret the reality. The phones tend to have wide-angle lens, and even if you zoom in, the distortions of the field are still the same. Oh, we're reaching our uh, end of our program, but we will still have a few minutes to conclude this conversation. Okay. We'll be talking about depth of field so if you're familiar with the concept you can move on uh, to the next episode but uh, if you're not I'm often asked uh, how the aperture works besides just controlling how much light gets into a camera and how light or dark your image is and in simple words the larger your opening of the aperture is the smaller will be distance on which uh, your camera is focused and if you would photograph something like this branch with the open aperture you will get uh, the image that is focused only on the certain distance, something like this. But if you close it all the way down and take the same picture, you will get the uh, almost the whole plane, everything like this, to be uh, in focus. And in one case, you will get uh, more uh, focused attention of the viewer on a specific part of your photograph. wanted to touch but one subject uh, we mentioned briefly before. Uh, most of uh, high-level professionals, if they were trained in film, actually tend to have uh, some sentiment to black and white photography. And I know that you don't share this sentiment as well as I don't. I actually do prefer color photography and I wanted to ask you to share with us the reasons. Your pictures are beautiful, the colors sometimes is the most beautiful part of the picture and the reason probably why this particular picture was taken but still i want to hear from you your reasoning behind the uh, color photography for you being more important than black and white i started in black and white i love black and white i made a switch to color when i was in college 
But now, I just see the world in color. The places I'm going, I think, need to be documented in color. And reality now is that, for me, processing or post-production of color is simple for me. I want to get the colors right, natural, what it looks like in the world. Yes. Black and white is just by the nature. It's it's not showing the world as it is. It's interpreting the world in black and white. And so as a photographer looking at the black and white in post-processing, you have so many options as to the look of the black and white. Indeed. So it's color is easier for me. And I've done a few things in black and white, and maybe in the future I will do something in black and white. It's in my blood. It's where I started. Uh -huh. I'll go back someday, but it's got to be the right project. It has to have the right feel, the right look. I just don't shoot black and white to shoot black and white. I would need to shoot it because I feel the subject matter really warrants black and white to tell that story. No, that's actually one of the uh, biggest reasons why I do believe that this particular treatment of the photo right now is so widely abused. It's so easy to make picture black and white and together again those notorious likes just because it's black and white. Yeah. And uh, nothing in the subject matter, in composition and anything else is basically dictated that that particular image is supposed to be monochrome. Well, I've seen people take a bad color picture and make it into black and white because the color just doesn't look right. So they make it black and white, make it moody, now they have a picture. Job's done. Yeah. All right, so let's hope that there will be a lot of good pictures in black and white and in color and uh, you will show us more decisive moments from all those civilizations that yet to be in front of your objective one day. And Thank let's you hope your view is, you know, love photography and use it for what it is, a great way to tell stories and look at the world. Great way to tell, tell the stories and look at the world. Great words. Thank you very much. Uh, okay. Thank pleasure. you, Alex. found that worth watching as much as I did. I'm Mark Unger for Roundtable. Thanks for watching.